to do. I don't want to waste your time. And I only have a, a certain amount of time today too. So let's go ahead and get started. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about mastery, the term mastery. Um, if you've watched any of my videos, you know I don't use that term very often. I tend to use the term absolution. And the first thing I want you to do is I want you to just think about where you are in your guitar path, whether you're learning chords or whether you're learning scales or you're learning licks or you're learning songs or whatever it might be. And I want you to think about this, and I'm not going to waste your time, but I want you to think about this. Most guitar players tend to learn little pieces of a lot of different things that are all kind of floating around out here in, you know, the virtual space. But the problem is we don't really know how to build something so it all comes together and all makes logical sense. And that's what I spend my time trying to do is teach people how to do that. And one of the most important things, one of the biggest impacts on, on my playing was when I started learning how to overlap concepts, okay? Learn how to see a scale with a chord, with an arpeggio, and understand enough theory to be able to make these things functional, to add melody and, you know, my phrasing and all these different kinds of things in there. Let's just think about the, the term absolution. So if you were using... Um, if you were learning a scale, let's just say you were doing something in E minor. Now, you might be doing E minor pentatonic. You might be learning diatonic, for instance. Right? Whatever it might be, you might be learning a couple of positions or something like that. And th this isn't a, a technique course. That's not what this is. So this, this conversation is not about how fast you can play and how many licks you know. That's not what this is. What I want you to understand is even if we took those two concepts, just that one position of each one of those, if we took the E minor pentatonic and we took the E minor diatonic, it kind of summarizes the idea behind the guitar course, which is being able to visualize what is similar and what is different and what you're gonna do with that information, okay? So if we look at that, what we realize is that the pentatonic contains five notes. And then, so I'm playing two and a half octaves essentially. When I go to play minor, I'm actually adding in two new notes. I'm adding in what we call the second, one, two, three, four, five, and I'm adding in the sixth, the minor sixth, if you will. So, and I add them in in different places as I go through the octave. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, and then I run into strings. So the nice thing about knowing that is, and again, with the course, you're going to learn theory and all those kind of things as well. But what I want you to be aware of is if you were learning this one position, again, whether it's pentatonic, diatonic, whatever. The key to absolution is that you want to be able to play that as comfortably and creatively as possible. Before you worry about all five positions and, you know, like I spent years going through what I call by route, by route practicing, which is setting a metronome, practicing positions up and down, up and down, up and down. And it's wonderful practice but it's a technical practice, okay? It is necessary, no doubt about it, because it, it gets you, it reinforces your knowledge of the positions that you're learning on your guitar, or the shapes that you're learning, whatever you wanna call it. But it's not the be all end all. You know, that's something that you most certainly need to do. That's a technical aspect of things. The, crea the creative aspect says, okay, well, let's take a look at this thing and let's try and memorize it to an absolute level so we can manipulate it. If we can't memorize it to an absolute level, which is mastery essentially, I can't use it for anything, okay? So I want you to be thinking about that, that um, um, as you're learning this thing, don't be worried about the second position or the fourth position or the mode of something or the whatever. If you haven't fully, fully spent quality time trying to figure out the first thing, because that's where you start getting lost. The misconception, and I don't want to just talk the whole time, but the, the misconception is, is or, or the misunderstanding, I should say, is, is when you're by yourself and you're practicing alone, okay, it's a very different experience than when you're with other people or you're in front of other people. And what happens is people tend to get nervous and stressed out and a lot of what they've been rehearsing or practicing goes away. 
they lose that stuff. And then afterwards they go, oh crap, I forgot about whatever, right? So you don't want that to happen. I'd rather have you have less information across the fretboard, but be able to really use that information. So today what I want to do is just so you understand the idea of absolution, okay? is don't be in such a hurry to do a bunch of things okay, but really try and learn how to pick two or three things to really focus on. So if I took this pentatonic that I'm playing, and I could learn to manipulate it, and do something cool with it that I'm gonna be able to use that more in the realistic situation. So if I'm given a jam track or people to play with, and I've already explored that creative space of that position, not just playing it up and down, not by route, but actually spent time trying to get to comfortable with it, knowing where things are. That's gonna make all the difference in the world, okay? Now, the second idea I want you to think about is overlapping concepts, and this is huge. Okay, you always build to an absolute level. Please don't forget that. So I'm not gonna keep going back to that, but just remember that for the rest of your life. The more you can build something that you truly need to an absolute level, the more you can manipulate it and use it creatively in your own playing. If it's just something that you've dabbled with, you, you can't. So overlapping is one of the most important things. So if you think about it, if I was playing this position of E minor, whether it's pentatonic or diatonic, right? And I can visualize a chord structure or I know enough of my theory to know the notes, for instance, of an E minor chord or E, G, and B, right? So those are two different ideas. Um, let's go with the visual idea first. So if I had an E minor bar chord sitting right here, and I look at that and I see 12, 14, 14, 12, 12, 12, okay? As I'm soloing using whichever scale I'm working on, As I'm playing, I try and find ways of emphasizing those notes either directly or indirectly by doing things like bending. Okay, so I start trying to visualize the two ideas over the top of each other. Let's say there was a D chord coming up next. Okay, so I was playing E minor to D or something like that. Then what I would want to do is visualize a D chord within the, the construct of that same position that I'm learning how to play. Well, there's, there's, that's what the cage chord system is, is to teach you how to play chords all over your fretboard, both major and minor chords. But let's say I just took the D chord here and I played it one octave higher. So I'm playing 14, 15, 14. Well, that's the construct right there. Okay, I see E minor sitting here and I see D sitting right here. So as I've got that pentatonic scale that I'm creatively exploring or diatonic or whatever you're using, instead of just moving around, I start giving myself direction over that E minor chord. I start trying to target the sounds of an E minor chord. And here comes D. Now if you watch that, I'm doing is I'm taking the idea of what we call an arpeggio and I start expanding that over the top. So let me show you what I'm doing here. Just make sure you've got this so you can practice this and if you need to, to check out more please click that learn more button and you can learn more about this uh, fretboard mastery course. But construct one right is the, the scale shape whether you're using E minor pentatonic or E minor diatonic and again, you could be using other things, but that's what we're using for our example, okay? So the second thing is, is I start overlapping it with chordal shapes that I'm familiar with. And I want to build more of those. That's why I want to teach you like the cage system and all that sort of thing. But let's just take those two chords, E minor and D. And I'm visualizing those up there. So as the E minor, me, e minor chord is being played, excuse me, then I'm trying to target something that has to do with that E minor. Okay, then the D comes up. Then I start trying to target something to do with the D. 
Now, if you were playing pentatonic, this would be a new note because you didn't have a 14 before uh, in your pentatonic, but because it's part of that chord, it now becomes part of that scale. You see? So it's really cool to try and utilize some notes that are, that are close to each other because then you can hear those nice little intervals, those distances, and add in some new and fresh notes. The way I've always approached it is I think about using kind of a pentatonic palette and then I move into the diatonic, use those extra notes for color. Now, I do shreddy things and things like that too, and you might as well, but I try and use those sparingly and then utilize that idea of, of playing some pentatonic and then adding some diatonic for color. So I'm overlapping the scale with the chord. Now, the more I understand about my functional theory, I call it, um, which we're gonna get to in just a second, and my overlapping concepts, I can put all these things together. So my overlapping, I've got two of them now, okay? I've got chords and I've got scales. Well, now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna elaborate a little more and I'm gonna start creating some other kinds of arpeggios that sound a little more creating, uh, creative. So I'm gonna show you two of these things that I would use, okay? And then you can practice these. One would be coming off that D major chord up here. So I'd play 15, 14, down to 15, down to 14, and then what I'll do is I'll slide down to 12 and go to 11. Which is very sort of David Gilmore-ish. And then I'll go to 12 and 12. And maybe I'll stop there. Or I might slide back to the 10 or something like that. But notice how that movement sounds vastly different from... That scalar sound, right? And the scale sound isn't bad. It's just, it, they're, they're two different ways of approaching it. So I'm using that scalar motion and I'm targeting notes from the chord. And then I use that arpeggio idea to take me around the fretboard different and unique ways, which is what I love to do. So if I wind up doing something like this, where I come off this, that might bring me into another position that I know on the fretboard, right? That then lends me to somewhere else. And that's the secret to this, is learning to overlap these ideas. Now, I would never worry about this stuff until I've got this thing built. And that's what I want you to think about. That's one of the most important things. Take your time. Build something absolute. When you go to practice every day, sometimes you practice you know, raw elements of technique and all these different things. And then you study, you just study your fretboard, right? You study a position or you study an overlapping concept, whatever it is. But then you move into this other creative space and you start trying to manipulate everything. So what we've got so far is we've got understanding absolution and understanding the logic of you approaching your fretboard so you're not overwhelmed by all these positions and all this theory and all these things, take little pieces and try and find stuff that fits logically in, in a concept that works for you. Like right now, what I'm doing is just playing at the 12th fret, but I can overlap multiple ideas in this one place and I can make some really great stuff. So number one is building to absolution, okay? Building these concepts, whatever they are. The second thing is then overlapping them together, okay, which we talked about. The third thing, is functional theory and make sure if this is something that you're interested in look for that look uh, learn more button so you can learn more about this guitar course and see if it's something that's going to work for you um, functional theory for me is not necessarily going really deep into music theory I've got guitar courses that do that but it's understanding enough theory so you can figure out what key you're actually in what scale you actually need what mode you actually need what notes are in that chord right what chord tones or non-chord tones are you dealing with so you can add some color into your, your current situation, right? Because we get this confusion sometimes that when we go to play, the first thing that happens is we don't even know what we're doing other than just moving around inside this shape and we're hoping everything works out, right? The second thing that happens is we start directing ourselves towards certain notes because those notes match the chord that we're playing. If it's an E minor chord, it's E, G, and B. So we start targeting toward those three notes, which is great. Okay, but there are notes we call non-chord tones that exist outside that chord. I 
like that sound right there. Let me put it on the clean channel here. And I'm not playing by variable. I'm not just, well, hopefully it'll turn out and it'll sound okay and I got to play in front of people and hopefully it'll all do a good job. The less chance there is for that, the, the more confident you are and the more you can start building who you really are as a player because you have confidence. Like you know where to go as opposed to, well, yesterday when I jammed, it turned out really good. And then today when I did it, it was awful. Well, there's got to be some element of consistency in that just like anything else in life. We can't just always apply chance. And again, when we're by ourselves all the time and we're always playing, you know, alone in our room to jam tracks or whatever, there's no stress. So our percentages might go up. But when we get in situations where we actually have to work with other artists, that may not work anymore. And so, you know, for me, I get I, I made a career out of playing with other people and getting hired to do shows or play on people's CDs or whatever it might be. And so my percentages have to be halfway decent so they want to hire me back to do more work right so it's just something to think about a little bit so that's to me what functional theory is it's not just all deep theory for the next five years of your life i think that's awesome okay but it's using theory to try and figure out what else you could do so if i was in this situation of playing an e minor and i've got the notes e g and b and i know where those notes are because I've been building my arpeggios, which we talk about in the course of... Uh... But then I've also got my non-chord tones. And utilizing all of those ideas at once, scale, the chord, the arpeggio, the logic, the theoretical logic, all of these things at the same time, as these chords are going by, this is what I'm thinking about, okay? It's just, it was absolutely life-changing to me when I started learning this stuff, because I just used to play by, again, by chance. And I was pretty good at it, you know? I, I, could, I could make stuff up pretty well, depending on the situation. If I was out of my logical element, the place that I, I, I was most comfortable, I was in trouble. And so I started realizing that in my line of work, I wanted to play with lots of different people doing blues or rock or metal or pop or whatever. I wanted to do it all because for me, guitar playing is the fun of the guitar. It's not just the style of music. Of course, I've got my, my certain styles that I like, but it's the experience of playing with other musicians and getting on stage and doing things or writing music together or whatever it might be. And I just found that I wasn't well-rounded enough. I just knew what I knew and hope that everything worked out. So that's the, the third thing I want to explain to you today is learning functional theory, things that are really practical to your situation so you can better understand the chords or the key or you know the, the scale choice that you're making, that sort of thing. The fourth thing that I think very few people spend enough time with is exploring what I call the creative space. We spend so much time building things um, and sometimes we build, you know, we build disconnected pieces, so we don't really understand how to put them all together to make something out of it. But the one thing people don't do enough of, they jam with songs. Like I see it all the time, people jam with songs. But when they're jamming, they're playing the same way over every jam track. Like they're, they're approaching it from the same way every single time. And it makes sense because they're playing by route, right? They're playing by their experience. What's really nice to do sometimes when you're in the creative space, I'm going to go back to clean here is you just spend time listening. Like you really listen. If you took the note E, for instance. Or major. Explore the sounds. Now, as you watch me screw around like that, you're going to see, you're going to see all of these concepts happening at the same time. Okay. 
my knowledge of the fretboard, which is my absolution, my mastery, okay? So to speak, again, don't get me wrong. I, I never consider myself mastered at anything. I just keep going, okay? So that's why I like to use the word absolution in my world. You're seeing overlapping, tons of overlapping concepts as I play because it's, it's what I really feed off of. And then there's functional theory, understanding that certain notes are going to sound better over certain chords or certain situations that I'm in. And then absolutely that last section of just spending, sometimes I find myself an hour or two, I might just be exploring creative space, just screwing around on my fretboard, which is a lot of fun. And I want you to learn how to do this. I want you to experience having some fun and trying some unique things and not always feeling like everything has to be by route. And I'm not making fun of that and I'm not saying it's bad, it's important, okay? It's kind of like changing the tire on a car or you know, changing the oil on your car or whatever versus you know, going out and going really fast or, you know, in North Dakota, we get a lot of snow and, you know, you can go out to an open parking lot and just whip your car around, you know, just all these different kinds of things that make the rest of it worthwhile. That's what I want you to be thinking about. So thank you so much for t taking some time to spend with me today or tonight or whatever time it is for you.